I'd like to help offset the cost of the shipping. There's donation boxes at the front of the church and back here as well. And the rest of the announcements. And I see we have um, several guests with us this morning, so thank you for coming and worshiping with us today, and we want you to feel welcome this morning. And so take time uh, now to shake hands with those around you. Welcome our guests this morning. making your way back to your seats you can be seated and join me as we sing blessed be the name of the lord
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for allowing us just to come to you, Lord. Just thank you for this church, and thank you for all the, the families that are represented here, Lord. Lord, be with uh, Brother Wayne today as he gives us our message, Lord, and give him the boldness and the, and the words we need to hear, Lord. Lord, be with these uh, tithes and offers, and give them for your glory, Lord. And all these things I pray in your name. Amen. <laughs> Of his glory, God became a man to walk on earth in ridicule and shame. As he were yet a servant, a shepherd, yet a lamb, a man of sorrows, agony, and pain. He is Lord.
Thank you, Dr. Hunter, for leading us in worship this morning. And thank you for being in attendance on this Lord's Day. I invite you to take your copy of the Scriptures and follow as I read from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 12 and verse 13. Colossians 3 verse 12 and verse 13. I have a message on my heart that I think the Lord placed on my heart for me and for you. And it's a message for times like these. I'm going to be speaking on the subject Forgiveness without limits. Forgiveness without limits. Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Notice again the last words of verse 13. where it says, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. And forgive as the Lord forgave you. There is one word that best describes what the gospel is all about. In my opinion, there is one word that best describes why Jesus came to this earth in bodily form. And that word is the word forgiveness. Jesus Christ 
was and is in the forgiving business. To the paralytic, he uttered these cheering words, Son, your sins be forgiven. He led the woman of Samaria who had been through five divorces, had five husbands, and had one live-in at the moment he spoke the words. He gave her a joyful heart cleansing. And he said to the woman taken in adultery, caught in the very act, he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your sinful life behind. He forgave Zacchaeus for his greed and his fraudulent practices. He said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to your house. Now not only did Jesus do a lot of forgiving, but He forgave repeatedly and magnanimously. He practiced He taught unlimited forgiveness. On one occasion in Matthew chapter 18, Peter asked the question, Lord, how many times should we forgive someone? Seven times, Lord? Now that was a pretty good number. It was in excess of rabbinical teaching. For many rabbis taught you were to forgive three times. So Peter jumped the number up to seven. And he said, Lord, should we just forgive them? Maybe seven times, Lord. And the Lord answered him with some celestial arithmetic when it comes to forgiveness. In Matthew 18, 22, the Lord said, until 70 times seven. That is... An unusual statement. The thrust of that teaching is forgive repeatedly and forgive completely. Offer unlimited, complete forgiveness. Jesus once commanded His disciples in Luke 17, don't miss this, to forgive the same person seven times in one day if they come back seven times asking you to forgive them, and they have a repentant spirit, He said, forgive them seven times in one day even. No wonder the disciples responded and said, Lord, increase our faith. It takes a lot of faith to be a big forgiver. And forgiveness is for winners, and unforgiveness is for losers. You remember His first word from the cross It was a cry of forgiveness. He said, uh, concerning his executors, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Now get the picture, we're at the cross here, and uh, the babble of wicked people can be heard, the crowd noise. Jesus hasn't said a word up until this point. He's been quiet while they railed on Him. And the first words that come from His lips are not words of curse, but words of blessing. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they did. Now, He's talking about His executioners. He's not giving them complete forgiveness like salvation. He's not canceling their eternal condemnation, he's simply saying, Father, don't zap them right now for what they're doing to me. That's what he's saying here. And the good news is this, that after the crucifixion, many that were there that day and many that railed on him, they did come to know that complete forgiveness we need. And so you'll find the centurion who was a part of the crucifixion, in a few hours he acknowledges who Jesus is. And we have reason to believe that he had believed upon him. 
On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people came to know Christ as their Savior. Many of those 3,000 had joined their voices in the chorus, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! And many of them were saved. And of course, of those on that day that were part of the crucifixion, the first one to repent would have been the thief on the cross. And those wonderful, sweet words that Jesus said to him today, Sir, you'll be with me in paradise. Now notice what I've said to you. The first two utterances on the cross of the seven that we have a record of, the first two had to do with forgiveness to his tormentors, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. To the thief on the cross, the second utterance, today you'll be in paradise. He forgave him. The Lord Jesus was in the forgiving business. Some years ago, the University of Wisconsin announced in their curriculum catalog that they were going to offer a course to college students. The course would deal with international, or excuse me, interpersonal forgiveness interpersonal forgiveness. It seems that people in academia and in the college setting felt like that college students needed to know about forgiveness. Now, I'm not sure what approach they took in their curriculum, but I want to tell you this. No course on forgiveness is complete without investigating the biblical approach and especially the teachings of Jesus on the subject. So for a few moments, let's just explore our Lord's key words about forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, I want to read that to you. Matthew 18 and verse 15. I want you to listen carefully to these words. He said, Jesus said, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. And if he listens to you, you've won your brother over. Notice what Jesus is teaching. The injured party, somebody's done you wrong. You, if they haven't come to you to seek out forgiveness, you have an obligation to go to them and try to make reconciliation. The injured party many times should take the first step if the other party is not taking a step towards reconciliation. So don't excuse yourself by saying, well, I didn't do anything wrong. No, God's in the forgiving business. And He wants His people to be in the forgiving business. And then when you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 through 24, listen to this. It says in these verses, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go, first go, and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now here is the other side of the coin. We said that those who've been offended ought to be quick to try to seek reconciliation. Even though somebody did you wrong, you didn't do them wrong. And now this passage says, the offending person, The one who has mistreated someone else. They ought to be in the forgiving business. We know that because the verses preceding this talk about how people can mistreat other people. And in that context, it says, if you're worshiping in church and you realize you have mistreated someone, go try to take care of that. So when you look at the Bible, not what you think and what you feel like doing, poor pitiful you, It's not what you think. Jesus is our authority and the one we follow. He says it doesn't matter whether you're the offended party or you're the offender. You ought to be seeking reconciliation and forgiveness in relationships. That's what Jesus said. And I wanted to make that clear as we talk on the subject this morning about forgiveness. Ideally, the offender are and the offended should meet somewhere in the middle, each hurrying to settle the matter with the other. I'll tell you this, one reason the offended party should not delay. Somebody did you wrong, poor pitiful you, and you're going to sit around and mope about it and pout about it and all this. Uh, and, 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 And that's not the way to handle it. 
That's not the way a godly person handles it. The reason you need to, if they won't come get it right, you need to go try to get it, start the ball rolling, is to prevent resentment from growing in your life. Most persons, when they've been mistreated by someone, they fester, they rankle with anger and with hurt feelings. And when you carry around hurt feelings in your life, week in and week out, month in and month out, and it goes on and on and on, it will carry a high, high price tag. I have counseled with a few people through the years in my ministry. I'm a pastoral counselor. And I've discovered that a lot of people who come to me who have physical problems, indigestion all the time, fatigue, insomnia, they can't sleep, all this kind of stuff, a lot of it has to do about the feelings they're living with and they won't try to do something about those feelings. Dr. S.I. Macmillan wrote a number of years ago a book entitled None of These Diseases. And in that book, he talks about how negative attitudes in a person's life can cause physical disease. And I've learned through the years as a pastor, dealing with just brothers and sisters in the Lord who often get in conflict, I've learned this. Sometimes it's not what you eat that makes you sick. It's what's eating you that makes you sick. And that's why it's important that you be a person who gets into the forgiveness arena. Jesus wanted His followers to air their grievances quickly. And the Apostle Paul echoes those sentiments. Paul said, Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Did you get that? I'm giving you the word this morning on this subject of forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, if we take Paul's words literally, let's say you're at your house and you're eating supper at 6 o'clock. And you get in a quarrel with your wife or some member of the family. I mean, it gets ugly. Y'all have words. Somebody leaves the table and storms out, didn't like what was said. And that happens at 6 o'clock, and, and at this time of the year, the sun sets at 8 p.m. That means you've got two hours to go get this thing settled. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. The principle is, deal with it quickly. Not carry it around week, 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 month, month, month. Only Satan, only Satan will exploit and get the advantage in that. Christ does not teach that you ought to wait for the other fella to come. He says, be quick, get the ball rolling on forgiveness. Don't wait till they come around. We've already seen the Scriptures, both parties, the offended and the offender. When grudges are nursed, it produces self-pity. When grudges are nursed, it produces vengeful spite. Corey Ten Boom tells of meeting a woman in Germany who had been cruel to her sister Betsy in a concentration camp. Corey Ten Boom was having to do some business dealings with this woman. And she says, when she writes about it, I hated this woman. Hatred, it grew in my heart for this woman because of what she did to my sister. But she realized that that resentment could only hurt her in the end. And so she petitioned God about the state of her heart. And this is what Corey Ten Boone wrote that she prayed. She prayed, O oh Lord, I'm not able to forgive. But you can put in my heart your love through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that your love is stronger than bitterness and hatred. 
And her testimony was that God did something in her heart that she couldn't do herself. And God enabled her. She had to relate to this lady. And it wasn't going to be good if she related to her out of hate. God enabled her to treat the nurse kindly. That's Jesus. Jesus would treat His offenders kindly. How much are you like Jesus? D.L. Moody once said, I can imagine Jesus saying something like this. Now notice, this is His imagination at play with what He knew about Jesus. He said, I can imagine Jesus saying something like this. Go search out the man who put the crown of thorns on my brow. Tell him I'll, I'll have a crown for him in my kingdom if he'll accept my salvation. And there'll be not one thorn on my crown. Wow. Moody said, I can imagine Jesus saying, Find the man who smote the reed on my head, drove those thorns deeper into my brow, and tell him, I want to give him a scepter. Wow. Moody said, I can imagine Jesus saying, go seek out that poor soldier who drove the spear in my side and tell him there's a better way to my heart than that way. It's interesting of the seven sayings on the cross, there's only one of those sayings that is presented in the Greek text in A linear action, a repeated action. And it's the prayer for forgiveness. And some have suggested that that tense, that tense repeated, suggests that Jesus Christ perhaps over and over said, Father, forgive them, Father, forgive. Every time they drove that nail here, forgive them. That nail here, forgive them. In their, forgive them. They suggest that maybe he repeated that. It's the only one of the seven utterances, one particular one that's presented in repeated uh, tense. The Pharisees had trouble with Jesus because he was in the forgiving business. They saw him fellowshipping with sinners. Friend of sinners, they said. And they murmured, look at him, he welcomes these evildoers. They're all upset because Jesus mingled with sinners and loved sinners and tried to help sinners. What's going on here? These Pharisees missed the purpose he came for. He came to pardon sinners. That's why he's mingling with sinners. The only petition in the Lord's Prayer when you study the Lord's Prayer, the only petition, Matthew 6, 14 and 15, that Jesus gives an explanation about, He just says, pray this way, pray this way, pray this way, pray this way. And He comes to that part about praying, Father, forgive me for forgiveness. And when He comes to that part, He says, I need to add a little word here. He says, if you don't forgive others, the Father in heaven will not forgive you. Read your Bible. Go home and restudy the model prayer. The only petition in that prayer he felt he needed to give a a little extra information about. That's a serious thought. Mark 11.25 repeats that. That if we're not forgiving people, don't you expect Jesus to forgive you once you call in that prayer closet and ask Him for mercy again? Because you're not forgiving. One of the most interesting parables that ever came from the lips of Jesus is Matthew 18. The parable of the merciless servant. Jesus used, get this now, exaggeration. Exaggeration to drive home His point. He's talking about the necessity of living with a forgiving spirit. He said there was a servant who owed his master a staggering, exaggeration, a staggering 20 million debt in today's money. 
He's about to be thrown in prison because he owes this big debt and he can't pay it. And so he begs his master for mercy. And he receives mercy. The staggering debt, the master forgives it. But then the man who had been forgiven $20 million debt, he goes out to this guy who owes him a $20 debt. And the man who owed $20 said, please forgive me. Forgive my debt. He wouldn't do it. And the master heard that, you know, I forgave him a $20 million debt. He won't even forgive a $20 debt. And he said, throw that merciless person in prison. And then Jesus ended the story with these words, verse 35. This is how, don't you miss this. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you. Unless you forgive your brother from your heart. If I understand anything about Bible principles and truths, I understand this to mean that the chastening hand of God will be on your life until you're willing to forgive your offender. He says, the Father will treat each of you. You merciless people won't forgive others unless you forgive your brother. He's going to treat you... With some chastening. Threw him in prison. It's interesting. And the master in that parable is the Lord. And it closes with verse 33. Some of the words. The master said, shouldn't you have mercy on that fellow servant just as I had on you? We're to forgive as the Lord forgives. You can't argue with that. You'll lose all day long. You can't ignore that. You'll pay the price. The truth is, those who've been forgiven much are to forgive much. There's not any amens in here this morning. Everything's quiet. Sometimes we don't really like truth, do we? A man announced, I'll forgive you this time, but never again. What if Jesus said that to you? I'll forgive you this time, but you don't get any more forgiveness from me. A woman said to her pastor, I'll forgive Mrs. X, but I won't have anything to do with her. I don't want to see her again. I won't let her in my house again. Oh, is that the way you're supposed to be forgiving? Suppose Jesus treated you and me the same way. I'll forgive you, but I don't want anything to do with you from this day forward. And you're not going to come to my house in heaven either. Sometimes people say, Brother Wayne, I'll forgive, but I won't forget it. Bless your heart. You're really spiritual, aren't you? I don't want you teaching my kids or grandkids the Sunday school class. I don't want you at all in there. You don't understand. I forgive, but I won't forget. You can't help but remember a grievance against you. You'll remember until the day you die that this person did this wrong to you. You can't get that out of your mind. That's not what forgiveness is about, forgetting something. Forgiveness is about not nursing a grudge against the offender. Turning the offender over to God and getting on with your life and stop wallowing in it. That's what forgiveness is about. It ain't got a thing to do with forgetting. You can't forget what happens to us. I want to kind of wind this message down by giving you some examples of people who found grace from God to really forgive. Some of you may be in here and say, but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what's happened to me. You don't understand, Brother Wayne. Oh, really? 
Well, I want you to listen to these true examples of forgiveness without limits. I got this information from an Associated Press article. A pastor, a pastor in Connecticut would officiate over the wedding of his son's killer. Let me tell you the story. His son got in a struggle with this guy who was a stranger. They were strangers to each other, but they had an argument and they got into a struggle, a fight. His son got shot in that struggle and died. The killer pleaded guilty to manslaughter. The minister was in the courtroom when he was sentenced to five years. And the minister thought to himself, no way can that be an even trade for my son's life. But he said something started happening in his heart. The preacher did. He said that the sentencing of this guy, the killer was allowed to say some words. And he apologized. Now, a lot of them do that. Some don't. But this minister said he listened to that man who killed his son. And he said something like this. I know this will probably sound like a bunch of empty words and... Most folks won't believe me at all. But I don't know what else I can do and what else I can say. I'm really sorry for what I did. The pastor said he left that event thinking there was some sincerity in his voice. He had dealt with a lot of people. He knew about cons. He knew that jail people say things you want to hear for whatever reasons that serve their... He knew all that stuff. But he couldn't get away from the fact that this guy was genuinely sorry for what he had done. He he said, I really felt that. And so in about a month, the pastor wrote the inmate. He's only been in prison now one month. And he wrote the inmate and he said to him, I forgive you for what you did to my son. I forgive you because of God's love in my life. The inmate said when he read that letter, he started weeping. He said, it made me feel like I wanted to live again. He said, before that letter, I didn't care about living anymore, what I'd done to that fellow. I just didn't even want to go on with life, what I'd done. And his father writes and says, I forgive you. After months of exchanging some letters, the pastor decided to visit the inmate. When he came into the room where they would meet, the inmate stood And they embraced and hugged each other and both wept in each other's arms. The Connecticut pastor testified for his son's killer at his first parole hearing. And in less than three years behind bars, he was released. 1991. And he stayed free of drugs. He held a good job for years. After three years, he met someone. He wanted to get married in 1994. And he contacted the Connecticut pastor to officiate at his wedding. And the pastor said, I'll be honored. The groom said, the man who killed the preacher's son said, I wouldn't have it any other way. He has become my best friend. And you tell me you can't forgive some little petty statement somebody said against you or some little difference you may have had. Let me tell you one of the most incredible stories of true forgiveness I have ever read. And some in this room know about it. I see Calvin Hubbard back there. 
I had my back. I usually get around. Calvin, it's good to see y'all in our service today. I love Brother Calvin. The last church where I was interim pastor, all they talked about how, how Calvin Hubbard wouldn't become their pastor. He was their interim and they wanted to be their pastor. They loved him. And if I heard it once, I heard it 40 times and I'm not embellishing it. Calvin, you were lovely, and God's doing a good work in, through you and your church in Bozier, and I love you, brother, and good to see you here today. But one of the greatest stories, true, true stories of forgiveness, are you listening? In relative modern times, it's when some American missionaries got killed by the Aka Indians. It happened on a riverbed deep in Ecuador, 1956, riverbed in a rainforest in Ecuador. Five missionaries for some time had been wanting to get the gospel to these primitive natives, these Aka Indians. They wanted to make contact with them. These natives were, lived reclusive lives. And anybody who ventured in their jungle territory... They were notorious for killing them. That was their territory. These men studied and planned for months how they would approach them. They even learned some of the Aka Indian language. A girl by the name of Dayama had left the tribe because they killed her family and she fled the tribe. But she could speak the language and they got in contact with her. And they learned the language of the Aqua Indians so that when they made that first landing, they could say the right things and they'd hear them and understand. They prepared meticulously for that reception. But things went bad. And all five missionaries were killed on that isolated beach. To make a long story short, are you listening? Two years later, after they were killed, with the help of Dayama, who came out of that tribe, Rachel Saint, sister to one of the martyred missionaries, and Betty Elliott, the widow of martyred Jim Elliott, went to live in that village. They lived there for two years unharmed. It was not an uncommon sight to see a blonde four-year-old Valerie Elliott being carried in the arms of the men who murdered her daddy. All five killers became believers. All five were baptized and became members of a church that was being built and established there. Over time, in the first three years, 900 Aka Indians became Christians and members of a church there. They changed the name of their tribe. They no longer called themselves the Aka's. Aka meant savage. They called themselves Huarani, which meant the people. They were not the savages anymore. They were the people now. They were people. Not savages. All because of the gospel. They were reached for Jesus because Christians could forgive. In 1966, ten years after they had been massacred, those five missionaries, two of the killers accompanied one of the widows and her two sons they went to the beach where the missionaries died and visited the common grave of those missionaries. Ten years later, the wife of one of those missionaries and her two sons, 16 and 14. And while they were there at that common graveside on that beach, the boys, 16 and 14, were baptized by two men that murdered their father. In the very river by which their father died, they were baptized by their father's killers. And that same year, 
one of those murderers that had become a Christian and saved was able to speak at the World Congress on Evangelism in Berlin and was introduced to the whole assembly by Rachel Saint. Her brother having been murdered by him. People ask, how could this sister and the widows treat so kindly these savages who murdered their loved ones? And the answer is, they are genuine followers of Christ. And they demonstrated forgiveness without limits. I could go on. I've got so many of these stories. And yet I sometimes sit behind a desk and hear people justify their unforgiveness over petty stuff. In the big scheme of things, petty stuff. My feelings got hurt. Somebody stepped on my turf. Da, 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 da. And man, is the devil having a heyday. One more and I'm through. He worked as a clerk with this company. And he embezzled funds. It was discovered, he was found out, he was summoned to the president of the company's office. The least he could expect would be angry dismissal. And the most he could expect would be several years in prison for embezzling company funds. He sat in the chair and the president said, Are you guilty? The clerk lowered his head and admitted his guilt. And he said, I'm sorry and I'm ashamed. The president waited and paused a little bit and then he said, I shall not press charges that might send you to prison. He was quiet for a while and then he said, If I take you back and let you keep this job, can I trust you now? The guy was surprised. He was humble. And the clerk gave him his assurance of full honesty. And then the president said these words. You're the second man who fell and was pardoned. I was the first. The mercy you just received, I received for the same thing you did. I received mercy many years ago. May God help both of us. The man now president of the company got a second chance because of forgiveness. And he had taken some things that were not his. And that's why he could forgive. A man who's been forgiven much, and everybody in here has, should forgive much. It's a natural thing to want to mistreat people who've done us wrong, cut them out of our lives. But the way Jesus thinks and teaches does not allow for that. How can anyone in this room who's received God's forgiveness keep their foot on their brother or sister's neck? I'll never know. Jesus is the greatest of them all. He's my hero. He knew that swords and guns may kill and maim, and they may conquer a territory for a season. He knew all of that about power men seek through those means. But Jesus knew something more important, that forgiveness changes, heals, and restores helpless lives. And I come here today to ask all of us who name the name of the Lord to be Christ-like. Examine our hearts and extend unlimited forgiveness. I got the call 1 o'clock, 1.30, somewhere there in the morning. I was asleep. Pastor in Summer Grove Baptist Church. And Rachel Free was crying. She was a florist, very successful florist. Her husband worked for Delta Airlines. I'd go speak somewhere 
at a conference. I'd get on a Delta plane and he had me a seat in first class. He took care of his preacher. I loved Doug and Rachel. Not for what they did for me, but for the kind of people they were. And Rachel said, Brother Wayne, Chris was just killed. Said he worked offshore and he was coming home late. He was coming home. And a person crossed the line, hit him head on and killed him. Can you come? We're at Shumpert Hospital, the old Shumpert. I met them down there. We wept together. We would find out later that the guy in the other car did not die. And he intentionally crossed the line. He wanted to commit suicide. He didn't want to live anymore. And he turned his car into this young man's car. And their son was killed for no reason. It wasn't an accident. It was intentional. Why did I tell you that? The young man went to prison. And after he was in prison, Doug Free worked for Delta. He said, Preacher, pray for me. I'm going to see him. I want to witness to him, tell him about Jesus. We can't bring our boy back. We can't unscramble an egg after it's been scrambled. We, we got to go on with our lives. And that guy's messed up and his life was a mess. And sometimes you just get the bad end of things. And he said, God's put it on my heart to witness to him. I'm going to go try to win him to Jesus. And I prayed for him. Don't tell me people can't forgive. Don't you dare tell me in any office anywhere you can't forgive. You lied. You don't want to forgive. You like nursing your resentment. You like being a martyr. You like being a victim. You like wallowing in it, right? I know because I've been there before. There's a better way. It's the Doug Free way. It's the Jesus way. Father, take this message this morning and help every one of us who name the name of Christ, those watching by live stream, those in this room, members of our church, help us as we go to the altar in prayer the next time to take inventory and to rid ourselves of unforgiveness and all of its tentacles that go with it that we might live free in Christ. Let it happen, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. You're here today and you're not a Christian. You've never been saved. I invite you to come and let Jesus forgive you of your sins. He died on the cross and rose again to take all your sins away. Give you the gift of eternal life. And I invite you to come this morning to Christ and be saved. If you're here today, I want you to examine your heart. We want, to be, we want to be so right with God when our new pastor gets here. He doesn't come in here and there's a lot of baggage we're carrying around from the past and stuff like that. God forbid, God forbid, we want to be in tune, cleansed. And maybe this message God put on my heart was more than just a message for me. Maybe it was a message for you too. And let he that hath ears hear what the Spirit of God is trying to say. Lord, bless this invitation. Save the lost, reclaim the wayward. Honor Your Word. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's sing.
trust and obey. All right, church, before we leave, let me remind you, tonight we continue our study in the fellowship area. We'll have a meal, 545. We'll have a good meal. We eat good. Every meal, we eat good. This is going to be really good tonight. We're going to have chicken tonight. Gospel bird tonight. Fried chicken. Nothing better than fried chicken. Well, you'd be hard-pressed to find something better. Uh, steak's not too bad, right? <laughs> but uh, we're going to have a good meal, and then we're going to have, after physical food, some spiritual food. And I've been teaching on how to help people go to heaven. We've been dealing with evangelism, emphasizing evangelism. People tend to move away from evangelism, never toward evangelism. And so we'll be talking. I'm going to be speaking tonight on the subject, when you don't want a witness. When you don't want a witness. I'm going to preach it first to me, or teach it first to me. I hope you'll come. We'll have a good time in the Word, a good time around the table, and a lot of good fellowship. Starting Wednesday throughout the month of November, we'll have our Bible study we normally have in here. I'll have it in the fellowship hall. Our children are getting ready for the Christmas program, and they need to be using the auditorium, practicing, and so forth. So please keep that in mind. Tomorrow night... Do we still, Julie, need some cakes and things for? I'm gonna go home and tell, tell Ms. Linda that you said you needed two lemon cakes, and then she baked two, and I'll keep one for me. So she really just, she really just said one. Okay, I try to get her to make a cake, and we did, we put we staff pretty good. Okay, all right. Tomorrow night's gonna be good. We're gonna have hundreds, hundreds of children and their parents. What a way to touch homes. I love you, church. Glad you're here. Calvin, would you lead us in our closing prayer, sir? Fathers, we come before you. You have done great work in my life and my wife's life. This area is our mightiest year. And I pray, Father, for this church. Individually, corporately, my heart would be right with you. Father, that. Speaking of any unforgiveness until it is cleansed. And that Father, your power and your might may be shining through the light of these people into this community, into this parish, and into the world, Father. I pray, Father, that you guide them as they search for a new path. Father, be with Brother Wayne as he leads them through this time and direct them, Father, and direct him. So, Father, that they are healthy. Father, may your spirit move greatly in the events that are upcoming. Father, for tomorrow night, that people may see the love of Christ. Father, within the fellowship and within the, the, just the, the giving of themselves into the kingdom. So we're asking your blessings upon this group, upon this body, and that your peace may flow. May they be instruments of your peace. Watch over us. Bring the congregation back, Father, to hear, sharing the word. In Jesus' name, amen. And folks, remember the mission trip in Puerto Rico. Nanny is there. Bubba had to stay with some health situation. He didn't get to go, but he prayed to the Lord. He had two scenes that I read about this morning myself. 